Welcome one and all. It's nice to have you. Let's just plunge right in because I hope to do something quite exciting today. I'd like to place before you a model. It's a philosophical model um, in seven steps. And it's a very, very exciting model. It comes from something that the Shankaracharya of Puri said almost in passing, you know. And it's a powerful model for a few reasons. One, it's a kind of seven-step ladder, uh, not only to enlightenment. I mean, it gives you all the intellectual tools necessary for that flash of insight that irrevocably alters the way you interact with yourself and the world, uh, hence enlightenment. But not only that, it also, oh, bye. So sad. Cat is leaving us. Bye, dear cat. Good luck on your paper. Nice to have you back, Amanda. We've missed you. So not only is this seven-step model um, a powerful tool for enlightenment, uh, but also it provides the means, actually, whereby we can enjoy our enlightenment. In other words, we can embody and live out in the remainder of our life the full bloom of that enlightenment. You know, you'll recall from classes past that there are many parts or components to enlightenment. And namely, there are three central ones from Jivan Mukti Viveka, the text that we studied, not studied, but looked, you know, I guess you could say cited from three lectures ago. There are three components. You'll recall they are first and foremost, Tattva Jnana, knowledge of reality. Remember, knowledge of reality, Jnana, this insight, this flash of, of cognition, not cognition, not, not quite knowledge. It's a very difficult word, but Jnana, maybe Gnosis. But it can happen through intellectual processes, this sudden insight that you are not this body, you are not this mind, you are not this world, and body, mind, and world is but a reflection in you, the formless awareness. That's Tattva Jnana. But you're not done. I mean, you'd have enlightenment at that point, but if you don't have the other two, then it wouldn't matter. Then you wouldn't be able to fully, uh, I guess, actualize that enlightenment in each and every moment of your life. Um, the other two, as you recall, are Vasanakshaya the dissolution of limiting desire, such as lust, greed, fear, craving, etc., and manonashya, the ability to simply sit and immerse oneself in the sweet, heady, indescribable bliss of non-dual contemplation. So the ability to just sit there and be is one of the prerequisites for enjoying your enlightenment. The ability to not be kicked this way and that by fear and craving is another, I guess you could say, a factor in enjoying your enlightenment. And naturally, those two, manonashya, the dissolution of the mind or the melting away of thoughts, as I like to translate it, and the dissolution of vasanas, desires and proclivities, those two things should happen naturally as a result of tattva jnana. So if you know what you are, if you truly understand here and now your essence nature as Brahman, as formless awareness, then naturally, what are you going to desire? What are you going to be thinking about? All your plans and ambitions will melt away before the uh, golden dawn, dare I say it, of your enlightenment, right? So naturally, these, these three, three things come together. You know, we could even say Tattva Jnana is Jnana Yoga, Vasanakshaya is Karma Yoga, and Manonashya is Raja Yoga. And the fruit of that is Bhakti, just living a life of devotion to the, to the self, which you'll see inherent in all beings and all things. Sarva Bhutani Chatmanam, sar, uh, sorry, Sarva Bhuteshu Chatmanam, Sarva Bhutani Chatmani. You know, the self is in all beings and all beings are in, is in the self, as it says in the Gita, as it says in the Ashtavakra. Okay, so that's enlightenment, right? And you'll know that there are two components. One, the Tattva Jnana itself, and two, living it out. Now, this model that we're going to discuss today, this model in seven steps, is designed to give you both. It's designed to provide you uh, the tools for the first and the second part of enlightenment. Isn't that exciting? I think that's incredibly, incredibly exciting. And this is a, almost a throwaway statement from the Shankaracharya of Puri, the current one. So I think it's kind of cool how like you get these little snippets and sound bites that are just so packed with meaning and power. Now, after the Shankaracharya, Shankaracharya of Puri had said it, Swami Sarvapinanda had uh, mentioned it in a couple of lectures. So I thought it's particularly relevant and important to talk about now. Um, and maybe we can here in this class kind of look into it, expand, um, extend that sort of thing. So what is this model? We'll get into it in just a moment. I want to say though that intellectually speaking, the tools offered in this model, the three pieces of the model, the three intellectual tools are first and foremost, the ability to recognize that you at your essence nature are none other than God, right? Isn't that exciting? You equals God. That's the equation of uh, the Upanishads, the world's most ancient spiritual philosophy. The basic teaching is that you're not fallen from a straight state of grace in need of salvation or rescuing. You're not somehow uh, lacking in need of healing or growing. There's nothing wrong with you, except, the, I mean, religion does, I mean, spirituality does require some starting point. So the only thing wrong with you is that you don't understand that you're perfect. <laughs> That's the kind of tongue-in-cheek 
problem that's no real problem in the Vedanta, in the Upanishads. So the central claim of the Upanishads is a Brahman alone is real. The world is not independently real. And you are none other than Brahman. Brahma Satyam, Jagan Mitya, Jiva, Brahmeva Naparaha. You, the individual, the individual soul, the Atman, the self are none other than this vast transpersonal Brahman. And as such, that alone exists. That alone is real for it is existence itself, for it is reality itself. So this model, this model in seven steps should convey that to you. Hmm? So as always, my hope is that by the end of this hour, you'll at least be irrevocably convinced that you are Brahman. You will never again fall into the delusion that you are the separate self, somehow isolated and alienated away from the rest of us, from the whole, you know? That's the first goal in any of these lectures. And remember, this isn't a faith-based approach. <laughs> in fact, in Jnana Yoga, faith is almost disastrous, you know? <laughs> because if you just believe what people tell you, it's not Jnana. That's a different path and it's a valid path. But in Jnana Yoga, the idea is for you to understand. Understanding is the goal. So insofar as that understanding isn't happening, if you aren't yet convinced that you are Brahman, then it's very important that in the Q&A after this lecture, you hash it out with me. Like we talk about it. We inquire as to where there is a gap in your understanding and we address that. Because the fun starts only after you have this uh, Brahma Jnana, I would argue. Uh, Tattva Jnana, to use the technical phrase. If you know, only then can we start talking about some other stuff, which is very exciting because the other stuff that we're going to talk about is the expression of your knowledge. That's the first thing. First thing that this model is supposed to do is give you that, that bit, that uh, realization, which is, I guess, the beginning and end of spiritual life. Okay. Then the second thing, second thing is it will give you the tool to actualize that realization by teaching you how to renounce those things that are not nourishing for your spirituality. No? So we talked about the value of renunciate, flower petal. That's the problem with putting the flower petals in these, these offerings to Kali. You drink it, you're like, hey, flower petal. So um, the, the next piece is a tool that you can use to help in the process of renunciation. You could even say renunciation is the fragrance of the bloom of your enlightenment, if I may say it poetically like that. Renunciation is kind of the after effect of enlightenment. It's the necessary truth test for whether or not that enlightenment has truly occurred. Um, and as such, you know, <laughs> to the degree to which you feel like you've let go of all these fears and cravings and of your stories of me, mine, uh, to that degree, you've embodied your Tattwa Jnana. So today we'll provide a tool for that, which I think is very exciting, very helpful. Now, the third thing is a bit philosophical. It's a kind of brief introduction to the Upanishadic theory of how this world came into being. Spoiler alert, it didn't. <laughs> if you ask the Upanishadic masters, you know, how did the world come into being? They'll smile at you cheekily with a glimmer in their eyes and they'll say, what world? <laughs> so at the very end, we'll look at this uh, bit of philosophy to look at maybe a few different stories, a few different theories of causality, of creation, right? And we'll see how none of them really stand up to philosophical scrutiny, leaving us with the inescapable conclusion that this world is really indeed an appearance. Arguably, this too is a tool for enunciation. If you knew that the brownie was actually a hologram, you wouldn't be so ready to reach out and grab it. You know, your desire for brownie will melt away almost entirely once you see through the unreality or see through the illusion that is brownie. So that's the three parts that I hope to convey in today's lecture. So shall we dive in this model? Um, and also, by the way, one last disclaimer, and it's this. Those of you who are new to the study of the Upanishads, to Vedanta, to non-duality, both Tantric and Vedantic, this can be a kind of introduction. That's actually a really good introduction, in my opinion, to the system of Vedanta, because um, I wish Kat was here. She'd enjoy this, because on an academic note, it actually covers 5,000 years of Indian religious history. And not only that, it covers all the various modes and modalities of religion and spirituality over the history of our civilization. You know, yeah, Tanme, actually. It, it, it's quite a disconcert. Uh, Tanme just said it's a, the brownie logic is disconcerting. It can be eerie, but exciting, thrilling, you know, thrilling. I think Chogyang Trungpa, however you might feel about him, I know I have mixed feelings, but that Buddhist Lama, Chogyang Trungpa, he um, used to say that this experience of Buddhism, he was talking about Tibetan Buddhism, but he says that this experience is like, you know, the bad news is you're falling through the void with no parachute. The good news is it doesn't bottom out. There's no floor. <laughs> That can sometimes be the feeling of doing this type of philosophy. It's a heady, thrilling joy, and at times disconcerting, but in my opinion, thrillingly so. 
You know, I mean, how thrilling is the statement that you are already free right now? Your soul song, you, the soul, your song is I'm free. I'm free. You've always been free. You always will be free. All you needed is one pointer to see that you're free. You know, so this model that we're going to be talking about tonight can do that. It's very exciting. Not only does it give you the tools for enunciation, very practical, but it gives you the most practical thing, which is insight into the true nature of reality. So in that sense, it's a good primer for non-duality. It's a good kind of intro um, <coughs> to non-duality. Now, those of you who've been studying non-duality for a very long time, you know, those of you who aren't new to it, who've been doing this for years and years and years, who are familiar with all the arguments, even for you, my feeling is that this will be thoroughly enjoyable because it will be a sort of not only review, um, but of a kind of guided meditation almost. Dare I say it? <laughs> you know, I'm not too big into guided meditations, um, but this one is something like it. It's like a, uh, the way we walk through these seven steps is a kind of journey from the gross to the subtle. So in step one, you start with the grossest, most obvious and most tangible principle, you know, and then from there in seven steps, we go into a subtler and subtler way of seeing ourselves in the world until finally we dissolve completely into realization. Now, not only that, it doesn't just walk you from gross to subtle. It gives you the rope to go from subtle to gross. So it's, it goes both ways. You know, a door can open both ways. A ladder can be used both ways. So there's a way that the tantrikas in the room, those of you who are interested in Shakta Advaita, the non-duality of Shaktism and the non-duality of Shiva, Advaita Shaiva philosophy, you'll see that not only is this a way to enter into Shiva, into non-dual awareness, but it's also a way to see how that non-dual awareness emanates the world into being. You know, it kind of describes the artistic process whereby awareness congeals this world um, like you know from the Pratya Bhikya Hridaya Sutra, no one can say it better than that. Svechaya uh, Svabhita uh, Vishva Munmilayati. Svechaya, driven by her own innate urge, Svabhita, Bitti, she's using herself as a canvas. She, Vishva Munmilayati, unfurls all this world into being. How does she do that? Why does she do that? Um, you'll understand by looking at this seven runged ladder. And in your personal life, in your own sadhana, you can use this as a kind of meditative tool for involution and evolution of awareness and uh, object or being and becoming, from becoming to being, from being to becoming, from object to awareness and from awareness to object. So it blurs the line between the inner and outer and allows you to interact with each and every moment as a kind of creative emanation of your own essence nature. You see? So <laughs> in a very exciting way, this model can be used as a meditative device. So I hope that you will imbibe it. You will memorize it, especially these terms and use these terms as intellectual pegs for various ideas. You'll take the system home with you, God willing, and profit uh, tremendously by it. I hope that you'll sit in meditation and use this seven rung ladder for both involution and evolution. So <laughs> Now we've really talked it up, <laughs> so no pressure here. <laughs> but <laughs> we've really set the stage. Let's, yeah, let's, let's hope this, uh, this will will meet those promises. <laughs> they always say under promise, over deliver. So, whoops. <laughs> let's start. Okay, let's start. Um, now, in seven steps, we're going to start first and foremost with what we know, with what is immediately available to us. Remember, this exercise is not an exercise in belief, in merely accepting the words um, of some fellow on the internet. You know, it's, it's not um, some clever intellectual system of philosophy that you're supposed to memorize and impress your friends at the dinner party with. You're not here just to memorize a few new Sanskrit words. No, this isn't a logical, analytical endeavor. Not really. Although it appeals to reason and logic, it's more of a kind of persuasive style of argumentation that guides you um, in noticing something that is already true. So don't think any of these are like affirmations. God forbid you use them as affirmations. You know, you're not supposed to go around going, I am Brahman, I am Brahman, I am Brahman, as if you're like affirming it. No, you don't need to affirm what is already true. You just need to notice that it's true. So it's actually a very quiet sort of process. It's a kind of shift, maybe, a kind of re-identification that happens and it happens very naturally and very easily. So follow along with these words. Maybe some of you might even feel like closing the eyes and coming into meditation. You can, um, you can look around, you can do whatever, but just follow along the, with the words and notice that the words themselves are inviting you to notice. Huh? So this is a noticing exercise. All right. 
So we'll start with step one, the first rung of the ladder. We'll start with what is immediately available to us. We'll call this Jagat. I'm just going to put it in the chat, Jagat. Jagat means the world. It means the world as we know it. In fact, another word you might see is Vishvam or Vishva. Vishva means everything. Literally, the Sanskrit word Vishva means everything. And it's like a sample set containing all possible things. In fact, in English, I think that word is universe. The universe is the sample set containing all possible things. You'll even hear it uh, called Prapancha. You know, that beautiful line in the uh, Mandukya. Prapancho Pashamam. You are the silence of the world. Universe, Prapancha. So whether you're using the word Vishwa, Prapancha, Jagat, universe, world, doesn't matter. We'll start there. And we have to start there because that um, is what's available to us right now. Good pedagogy is going from the known to the unknown. We can't just jump straight into the unknown from the unknown. That's mere speculation. So let's not speculate. Let's pause now and notice that around us, about us, within us, all without us is the universe. Prapancha, Vishvam, Jagat. In fact, I think whenever I say the word universe, I think of Liam. I wish Liam was here. He would enjoy this. So, you know, Liam. So anyway, uh, here we are in the universe, supposedly. I'm apparently a part of this sample set called the universe. What does the universe contain? Well, <laughs> not to beat a dead horse, but everything, right? So we're talking about stars, like far, 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 far away stars, distant stars. Many of them might not even exist anymore. We're just seeing their light, thousands and thousands of light years, billions of light years uh, after the fact of its like, I don't know, collapse maybe, who knows? So out there is a universe and you can look into the night sky and really you're looking into the past. You're looking into this like time machine of all the solar systems. And there's so many of them, you know, as many grains of sand as there are on all the beaches of the world, that many and many times more are there universes scattered across the black canvas of the sky. Now, imagine each of these stars, imagine like solar systems about each and every one of them, maybe planets with sentient life. Remember the Goldilocks zone idea where there are all these planets that are possibly habitable, you know, with water that are earth-like, maybe they're peopled by beings and beings that we haven't yet met. Maybe one day we'll meet, who knows? Just for a few moments now, expand your imagination to be as inclusive as possible of the universe. All the black holes and all the stars and solar systems and galaxies and clusters and super clusters, wheeling and wheeling and wheeling like so many dervishes or Sufis dancing, you know, just like that. I heard a beautiful poem I digress, but I have to. It's a poem from Hafiz, the Sufi master. And uh, it goes like this. I read it the other day. It goes like this. Um, I'm paraphrasing. This is from the Ladinsky, Daniel Ladinsky translation. The earth braces itself for the feet of the lover of God about to dance. <sighs> that was so nice. The sky becomes timid when the great saint waves his arms in joy. For the sky knows that its precious fixtures, the sun, the moon, the stars, could all end up rolling wildly on the floor. <laughs> what a beautiful poem. In fact, as a result of this seven-pronged ladder, that might happen. You know, this whole universe might tear apart, actually. And you'll find it rolling on the floor of your apartment. That's why I want to really invest the time here now to blow up this picture. The bigger you can imagine it, the more exciting it will be when we crunch it now in your mind. You know, so just imagine all the galaxies and superclusters and all that wheeling and wheeling and wheeling about eternally. And also imagine all the explosions that are happening. You know, huge stars are like collapsing. They're turning blue and green and purple. Old stars, young stars. I mean, uh, elements are forming from, from these explosions. And all of it is so intense and so exciting. And it seems to be happening in this profound silence. There's no air there to act as a medium for sound. So all this tremendously cataclysmic stuff is going on in absolute silence. I mean, it's thrilling to think about. Not to have like a Neil deGrasse Tyson moment or a Carl Sagan moment, but maybe let's, let's humor that. Let's have that moment of, wow, this is an incredible universe, right? Okay, now we can have some fun. So this is a Jagat the available world. And, and plus, we can even go further and say Jagat, actually, tantrically speaking, might include the 118 subtle realms, the Bhuvanas. Uh, maybe Vedically speaking, it includes the 14 realms, seven heavens, seven hells, right? Like we talked about in our Tantra class and last Monday, there's a vast like mythological cosmogony or cosmology as well. And you might now just insert that here too. But I'm not interested in doing that really, because I just want to stay grounded, practical, and I want to start with what is immediately obvious and immediately available. Many will deny that there are 100 18 Bhuvanas. 
right? Many will deny that there are 14 worlds. Who knows, right? But we can't, none of us, none of us can deny that there is indeed this universe, at least, this universe of stuff, of things, of planets, of trees, of cars. And interestingly enough, I've been talking about big things. I've been talking about like suns and stars, I mean, stars and solar systems. But wait, I, I totally neglected the small things. Forget the Newtonian mechanics. Now think about like quantum stuff, you know, the really, really tiny things. Um, there's so many of that too. And, and as it says in the Tripura Rahasya, a great and beautiful text, in this corner of the room alone, entire universes exist. In this ancient Sanskrit text, there's this idea that in one corner of your room, there are worlds wholly unknown to you. They're all just there, you know? So this universe contains big things, it contains small things and everything in between. Okay, all well and good. And here we are in it, we're experiencing it. We're moving about and having our being in this universe. That's the first step, Jagat. Now we're about to move from Jagat to the next term in our seven rung ladder. So we're about to go now, as I said earlier, from gross to subtle. By gross, by the way, I don't mean, ew, this is disgusting, don't touch anything. No, I mean gross as intangible, physical, and obvious. <laughs> it's obvious we live in the world. And by the way, if you stop here, it's wonderful, but it's kind of brutish, right? Just to kind of take things as they are to say, yeah, here's the world. I'll ask no questions of it. Either that's like super enlightened or just plain stupid. <laughs> it's one end of the spectrum to just look around and say, yeah, this is the world. Um, I have no queries. I have no questions about it. I just, let it be as it is. Either that's the absolute point of enlightenment or just absolute negligence. No intellectual inqu inquisitiveness at all, right? So I think it's not desirable to just leave it at this. You can. And by the way, most people do. Most people don't ask questions of this universe. And if they do, they only ask it on the level of Jagat. They don't go to this next level of subtlety. And what ends up happening? You live what I think Socrates would call, what Plato would call the unexamined life. Meaning you just move around and have your being in this universe without ever asking once what this universe really is or what it's for. You have to know what something is in order to know what to do with it, right? If you have a tool, you're going to need to know what the tool does. What's the point of a key if you can't find the lock? In other words, um, how often can we walk around and have our being without ever inquiring into the metaphysics of all of this? Like they say metaphysics is abstract and obtuse. It's just conceptual philosophy. But no, it's incredibly practical. In fact, metaphysics, the metaphysical question of what am I and what is this world? What's the fundamental nature of reality? That actually is prior to every other question. It's prior to every value-making system. It's prior to beauty and ethics and every sort of human meaning depends on answering this question. What is this? <laughs> and once I know what this is, I'll know what to do about it. Okay, so it's only fair that we ask, what is this jagat? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to walk up the ladder and you'll notice it's going from gross to subtle, but also it's, it's a step-by-step -step reduction, you know. Um, that professor, Arindam Chakravarti, I, I uh, and Sydney, I, I remember, I haven't forgotten. I just haven't been at my computer for some time, but I will send you that video and I'll put it in the chat so all of you can see. There's a beautiful video of Arindam Chakravarti discussing the yoga of Asishta. And I'm actually going to appeal to some of his argumentation today in the third part of this model. Um, but he's this great, great um, eminent Indian philosopher. And he calls this nothing buttery. It's just the step-by-step -step reduction of the thing. So what is the universe? If you ask that question, what is the universe? You know, you can say meaningfully, it is nothing but matter and energy. It's nothing but matter and energy. The entire universe, both large and small, can be reduced to the play of matter and energy. And in fact, you can even reduce it to matter and reduce that to energy. So see, no modern scientist will reject this. I mean, most modern scientists are going to accept this model. Take life, for instance, as complicated as life must be. How mysterious this process of life. You can reduce it. You can reduce this mysterious process of life to physiology, right? Life is physiology. Then you can reduce physiology to biology. Life is physiology and physiology is nothing but a series of biological processes. And then you can go further. What is biology? Well, it's just chemistry. You can reduce biology, the study of life, to the study of just, you know, um, the study of uh, chemicals and how chemicals interact with one another is really the enzyme reactions in the body, anything more than that. And then you can reduce it even more to physics. So all chemistry can be reduced to physics. What are chemicals? They are what are molecules? You know, there are atoms, elements, what have you, and they are in turn, maybe super strings, quarks, et cetera. So uh, everything from quasars to quarks, you can reduce it down to physics. In fact, before physics was physics, it was called natural philosophy. 
It was a type of philosophical endeavor to understand the fundamental nature of reality. So before the split between metaphysics and physics, physics was the working metaphysics of the ancient world. You know, um, so let's do some physics now. That's why I think if Liam was here, he'd be very excited. Excited. If we're doing some physics, and any, any physicist will say this, this world is nothing but the play of matter and energy. The Indian mind says it this way. Uh, pancha, bhuta, vilasa. So by the way, I'm going to put this in numbers, okay? Jagat. And now number two is pancha, bhuta, vilasa. It's important that you kind of understand these phrases um, because they're like pegs for the intellect to to be able to use and memorize this model, memorize and then use this model. So I don't want you to like lose the model. So that's why I'm going to put it in the chat. So just for just a moment, please feel free to use the chat, but just for a moment, uh, refrain from like putting anything in the chat. I'm just going to spell out the model. Okay. Then once the model is there, go ham. You can do whatever you want in the chat, but just let me, let me spell out the model first. So the second one is Pancha, Bhuta, Vilasa. I'm just going to put the other four. I mean, other uh, five. The third one is called Maya Vilasa. The fourth one is called Chit Mila, Chit Milasa. Chid Vilasa. Uh, then we have Chin Maya. No, sorry, sorry. Chid Chid Viverta. Six Chin Maya. Uh, oh my God, I typed five twice. Sorry. And then seven. There are only three types of people in the world those who can do math and those who can't. <laughs> Oh, seven chin matram. Okay, so now you can see this. This is the seven pronged ladder. Okay, so it starts with jagat. It goes to pancha bhuta vilasa, then maya vilasa, chid vilasa, chid vivarta, chin maya, and chin matram. Okay, so it's a seven stepped ladder. We're gonna go one jagat, two pancha bhuta vilasa, three maya vilasa, four chid vilasa, five chid vivarta, six chin maya, and seven chin matram. Don't worry. We're going to explain all of those terms one by one. I'm just going to put it here. So if you want, you can copy and paste this somewhere. I'm glad Teresa has exclaimed and is enjoying this seven prong ladder. Um, so yes, I'm just going to put this in the chat. Now feel free to use the chat and scroll up if you need. Okay. I'm just going to leave that there. And I'll put it also in the description of this video. When we post the video or the podcast or whatever, I, I God willing, I'll be there for you in the description. So we'll start now with Pancha Bhuta Vilasa. Vilasa is a lovely word. Oh, no. Vilasa means play. How beautiful. Vilasa means play. So this world is what? It's the play of matter and energy. Pancha means five. Bhuta means element. So the Indian mind says that this world, this universe, Jagat, this Vishvam, this Prapancha is nothing but the play of five elements. Pancha, Bhuta, Vilasa. It's just all these different elements coming together and being reconstituted in this or that way. So elements come together, they form this thing. They come apart and they form some other thing like that. All of this can be reduced to the five elements. I mean, what are they? In the Upanishadic cosmogony, you get this idea of like, first there was, okay, wait, no, this is going to kind of spoil the rest of the lecture. So I won't go there. But uh, this idea of like, there are five basic elements, which are Prithivi, earth, um, Aap, water, Tejas, fire, Vayu, wind. Uh, some people call this air, but really it means moving air, wind. And finally, Akasha, space. Now, can you think of anything that's not made out of these things? I mean, yes, you can, but I mean, in Jagat, in the world that you can see, everything if you look at it closely, you'll notice that it's just some kind of configuration of these five. So this human body, take, the, take it for example, you have earth, you have the bones, the material earthy part of it. Then you have the blood and the fluids, you have up, you have tejas, the digestive fire in the belly, you know, then you have wind, the breath, the breath is moving. And then you have akasha, space, in which all these four other elements play, right? So akasha, vayu, um, tejas, up, prithivi, Space, wind, fire, water, earth. I feel like this is the introduction to Avatar, The Last Airbender or something like that. I feel like, I feel like we're just launched. I, I, I can hear the opening music suddenly as I go, as I say the elements to you. And yeah, Cesar is making a good point here. This is true for the Chinese as well. The five element theory. In fact, most ancient cultures have this idea that um, everything in this world <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's so funny. It, very early on in the TikTok adventure, I was demonstrating the lotus seat, uh, how to kind of practice for lotus seat. And there was like a meme, a kind of recurring motif in my comment threads where people would say, Ang, is that you? Because I think the legend of uh, the last airbender had like kind of had a re renaissance, a bit of a renaissance on TV. I think it came out on Netflix. Then people started watching it again, reliving their childhoods. So I think that replay 
you know, the, the, the repeat of the, the legend, the, what is it called? Avatar series was very important for our class. Cause I think it reinvigorated people's interest in spirituality and suddenly they came. <laughs> yeah. So Ang, is that you? <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. That was a good, that was a good time. This is a good time. That was funny. Back when there were like three people in the Zoom room. <laughs> anyway, good times. Um, okay, so Pancha Bhuta Vilasa. This is true for most ancient cultures. Five elements. As Cesar is pointing out, the Chinese had the same schema. The Indians had the same schema. Everything can be reduced to some kind of play of these five elements. Now, the modern conception of chemistry is not that different. Chemistry was also interested in finding basic elements. And at, in the beginning, before Anton Lavoisier and all that, it was elemental, you know, uh, like alchemy, like in alchemy, before alchemy became chemistry, you had this earth, the downward pointing triangle with the slash across it. You had air, the upward pointing triangle with the slash across it. And then you had the downward pointing and the upward pointing triangle of fire and water. And you had these other things like salt and sulfur. And like, anyway, this idea of trying to find the basic stuff that's been consistent throughout history, European, Chinese, everywhere. Um, and then even Anton Lavoisier, you know, when he's proposing this chemical model, this periodic table, it's really just this, you know, it's really just this idea of finding fundamental elements or fundamental chemicals. And, and then you could say in physics, now our modern theory is matter and energy. So even matter can be reduced to energy. You can call it super strings. You can call it, you know, the atoms are becoming finer and finer and finer, less and less real, almost less and less physical, more and more empty space. But anyway, the point here is that this whole world is nothing but pancha, bhuta, vilasa, the play of the five elements. So ignoring now the modern permutations of this model, I'm just going to stick to the five elements, but just note that in principle, the chemical periodic table and the physical like string theory, all of that, it's, it's the same in principle. Okay. How is this important? This is actually a very, very, very powerful and profound idea. If this entire world is really just the play of the five elements, and I hope that you can see that now, and if you can't in the Q&A, I hope you'll debate me on it. If this whole world can really be reduced, follow this closely, this whole world can really be reduced to just these five elements playing, then there's no real difference between one thing and another thing. Can we say that? Everything ultimately is just these five elements playing. Beyond your stories and your superimpositions, what you're looking at is nothing but, here's the nothing buttery, it's nothing but five elements playing. Some things have more fire than other things, some things have more earth, some things have more earth, but it's just that. It's just these five elements. There's nothing more to it than that, okay? Um, so doesn't this mean, if you were to be honest with your scientific discovery, that you would totally renounce your preferences? I think Swami Ashokananda said it so beautifully in one of his lectures. I was reading in the book, Ascent to Spiritual Illumination. Swami Ashokananda was this great monk. You know, he came to, uh, from India, he came here and he used to give talks in the San Francisco center. And he was very important in the kind of coming over to America of Vedanta. So Swami Ashokananda, I heard he was a very magnificent kind of royal man. When he spoke, there was such like, there was such an imperial quality. I never heard him. I can read his words, but there's like the Swami Vivekananda vibe that you get from him. Very powerful words, like earth shattering words. And I read in this, this transcribed lecture, he was saying exactly this. He was saying, if a scientist was to be honest to his discovery, he would have perfect renunciation actually, because he would have what the Bhagavad Gita is calling Sama Drishti, same sightedness, the ability to be preferenceless. Um, and now in the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, someone approaches Sri Ramakrishna about, uh, and one of his monastic disciples, so a very elite spiritual practitioner approached Sri Ramakrishna about cravings. He can sense that cravings are causing him to lose his spiritual autonomy. He feels whipped about by his cravings. He feels like maybe there are addictive patterns and, and behaviors that he can't control. A yogi is one who's mastered her responses to the world. And he wanted to be a yogi. He knew that he, have to over, he has to overcome these cravings in order to feel like he's in control of the body, mind, and really be an integrated being. Okay. And by the way, last week's lecture, when we talked about addiction and overcoming addiction, in that lecture, we spent a lot of time sketching out the theory of sangsara you know, the world of comings and goings of birth and death and why craving is painful, even though you can satisfy it for a little while, ultimately it's still painful. As Swami Vivekananda would say very beautifully, uh, all pleasure, please note this. And if you don't believe me, watch, watch closely how the pleasures work, go out into the world, eat, eat the fruits that you want to eat, enjoy the world, but watch closely. And you'll notice, I'm not going to put this idea into your head, uh, but maybe many of you have already noticed that as Swamiji said, all pleasure comes wearing a crown of thorns. You martyr yourself on the cross of your pleasures. They're fun in the beginning, but they almost always create craving appetites that cannot be fulfilled. I've been told the story, the cat, uh, what the give a mouse a cookie. 
you know, if you satisfy one appetite, 10 more will arise. Like it's like whack-a-mole. You can never be fully satisfied from quenching your thirst, you know? So you're thirsty for something. You don't know what it is. And you're drinking things that will never quench that thirst. Okay. So if you go out into the world and start to live for pleasure sooner or later, you'll feel trapped by them. And we discussed that extensively last week. So I won't, and by the way, the starting point for these lectures is that anyway, right? You're here in spiritual life because you've sensed the limitation of worldly life. You're looking for something more than wealth, power, pleasure. You're looking for something deeper, a more meaningful way to live in this world than the modes and methods offered to you by advertising. You discovered, hopefully all of you, that no amount of conditioner, no matter what the advertisements are saying, will actually meaningfully make you happy. <laughs> no amount of money in the bank account will meaningfully make you feel secure. No amount of fame or likes or follows will allow you to feel meaningfully like you belong. No amount of relationships will have you feel the true intimacy of knowing you are not different from your brother and sister. You've discovered that, hopefully. That's almost an entry level requirement for spirituality. And that's okay. Don't feel excluded. If you haven't had yet that realization, then meet me in the Q&A. We'll do it, right? In the Q&A, I will come at you with Himalayan fury and try my best to shake you from your fascination of pleasures, of your worldliness, okay? It can be cured through intellect and philosophy. Um, but also, then I will soften a bit and tell you that there's no moralizing here. It's just like a child finishing with her toys, right? There's nothing wrong with playing with toys. But now you're growing up, it's time to finish with it. But there's a transitory period where you're not quite done with these patterns, though you, you're done believing that they will satisfy you. We've all been there, right? We want to announce, but we can't. We're stuck. There are patterns that own us, you know? <laughs> I think someone posted, I think it was Casey who posted today. Are you having your desires or are your desires having you or something like that? But anyway, let's save that for the Q&A. It's one of my favorite topics, actually. Monasticism, renunciation, asceticism. Like once you get me started on that stuff, I can't stop. So um, I'm going to stop. I'm going to try my best to stop here. Let's move on. So this is for the person who has already sensed the limitation of desire, but is still struggling to actually not follow through with these patterns that they know aren't nourishing. So a disciple comes to Sri Ramakrishna and explains this problem. Sri Ramakrishna in response says, okay, here's the first thing you should try. Pancha Bhuta Vilasa. He says, he suggests this. He says, look, say you want rasagula. This is the example. It's a kind of Indian sweet meat. Let's say you're hankering after rasagula, right? Like a sweet tasting rasagula. Now, you might suddenly get up, leave your house and go looking for rasagula. You go all over Calcutta looking for rasagula and maybe all the sweet shops are closed. So you're frustrated and angry. Instead of that though, before you get up and forget your meditation and run out into the world and exhaust yourself trying to satisfy your rasagula craving, instead of that, why don't you pause and consider what's really there in rasagula? And here you should be able to say, ah, isn't it, not, isn't it just the five elements? Isn't it just the play of earth, water, fire, um, wind, space? Isn't rasagula, this Indian sweet meat, really just that in essence? Can't you reduce this thought, rasagula, to just the five elements? And if you can do that, then you look at the potato curry in front of you and you'll realize, oh, what's there in the rasagula is also here in this potato curry. There's nothing in this potato curry that isn't there in the rasagula. So I'm just going to eat the potato curry. I should be just as happy eating the potato curry. You'll notice this actually works when you start doing this kind of uh, intellectualizing, dare I say it, or I prefer to call it an inquiry, or better yet, a noticing. When you start to do this kind of noticing, Vipassana style, the insight is, wait, there's nothing there that's not here. And there's nothing here that's not there. Slowly, slowly, through the gradual application of this technique, your preferences will be diminished greatly, which will save you a lot of headache in life. You know, can you imagine going to, your, to a restaurant and someone gets your order wrong and you're chill? I'm not saying don't advocate for yourself. Or maybe I am saying that right? I don't know what I'm saying. All I'm saying is that there's nothing in the rasagula that's not in the potato curry. Realize that and be free. That's it. It's as simple as that. There's nothing in that body that's not in this one. So why do you lust? What's really, what's there in that body that's not here in this one? This body is five elements, no? That body is five elements, no? What can you gain thereby by bringing these bodies together? All bodies are made of five elements. In fact, all things are made of five elements. All the things you are averse to are also five elements. Okay, that's why the tantrics had these very, I'm not going to gross you out, but they had these rites in which they walked the talk and they demonstrated that they weren't afraid of the five excrements. Okay, I won't say anymore. <laughs> the unmentionables. You know, in a Swamiji puja, 
we offer Swamiji a cigar and some bacon. That's what he liked to have when he was here in America. He wasn't squeamish about his food. Although he was an advocate for vegetarianism, like the Dalai Lama, they, he ate meat while he was in America. I imagine there weren't a lot of veggie grills back then in the 1890s, so he kind of had to eat what he was given. But he, he really enjoyed, apparently, his uh, cigar and his bacon. So he would have that in the mornings. And so in a puja, we, we try to give the deities what they would enjoy. So Kali might like some wine like that. Like, so we give him the cigar and the bacon. So I remember one time after offering these things in the temple, they're prasad. So they're brought back into the monastery kitchen and served to everyone who comes for breakfast. So I remember when I was at the breakfast, um, we were laying out the dishes and Swami Mahayogananda, who might come here and speak in a few weeks, he said very funnily, uh, yeah, you can place the unmentionables over there. He's talking about the bacon. <laughs> I love that word, the unmentionables. Okay, so these five excrements, the unmentionables, all that stuff, there's nothing really in it that makes it dirty or gross. It's just five elements, right? So you don't have to be averse to it. I'm not saying go out and eat. You know, I was telling this to my friend. We are, one more anecdote. My friend and I, great yogi. I, I'm so, so enamored of this yogi and I'm just drinking, having the satsang, drinking in his company, having some chai at the... Um, Tibetan restaurant here, Tara's, my favorite Tibetan restaurant. And there are people in there who are like, you know, from Tibet and we're just all talking together. Kedu and, and everyone else there at the restaurant, we're all talking together. We're talking, talking. So on the car ride uh, from that restaurant, we were discussing the Tibetan Buddhists and how all these great lamas like Songkhapa and Mifan, they're eating meat, you know, up there. Like there's a lot of yak stew, Sherpa stew. They eat meat. Um, but have you seen spiritual masters, the likes of those people? I mean, wow, they're spiritual giants. They're eating meat. So basically, we're making this whole point about like, let's not be squeamish. Let's do Vedanta, not foodanta. Let's not confine religion to the kitchen. We what we want is a strengthening religion, not a religion that weakens people because of over, over, being overly precious with food and all that. Now, then as you were having this conversation, he said, look, there's a burger lounge. And he made this joke as if he was going to go. <laughs> I'm not saying go to burger lounge, right? Keep your vegetarian diet. Certainly. I mean, the greatest masters I've met most of them have been vegetarian. I'm myself a vegetarian, right? But if you eat meat suddenly, like accidentally, why should you freak out? There's nothing there in the meat that's not there in the vegetables. And there's nothing in the vegetables that's not there in the meat. They're all the play of five elements, ultimately speaking, right? If you reduce it ultimately. So doesn't this mean that your aversions are no longer as averse to you and your attractions are no longer as attractive to you. This is a powerful tool to mitigate both fear and craving, both hatred and attraction, repulsion and uh, fascination. I hope that you can appreciate the power of this because I think many of us are not yet ready to finish with our fascinations and our aversions. There's a kind of morbid joy in it, right? There's a morbid joy in liking stuff and hating stuff. Haven't you noticed all of us enjoy hating? <laughs> And we love telling others about it. We not, there's nothing more than we love than expressing what we hate. <laughs> so uh, arguably not many of us are ready to stop hating, stop being averse. And arguably not a lot of us are ready to stop liking, <laughs> stop being fascinated. I think some of you will be like, that's so life negating. Sure, sure. If that's you, that's fine. We talked last week about the two groups of people in spirituality and spirituality invites both groups and engages both groups in different ways. I'm now talking about like a kind of high spirituality in which you've already realized that peace is a little more valuable than the fraught happiness of chasing things that you like and running away things from you hate uh, that you hate. Because I hope that you've all seen now in the course of your life that the things that you hate will catch up with you. Old age, sickness, death. If something is gross, it's going to touch you, right? Like the, the bird will poop on your head, though in India, it's kind of auspicious. You might step in cow poo. Like, you, you know, this stuff, this gross stuff, it'll come to you. Don't worry. If you're averse to like the unmentionables, wait till old age when you can't control the bowels and you like shit your bed every other night. It's gross. Old age is gross. Wait till you have kids, right? The throwing up all over the place, peeing, you know, like, ugh. But wait, it's inevitable. So instead of just saying, ugh, ugh, and running away, realize that there's nothing there that is more than the five elements. That will reduce your aversion. My parents are doctors and I was always so impressed how they could handle um, such gross things so nonchalantly. It wasn't gross to them. And I think because years and years of the medical profession, they've realized there's, what is this really? There's nothing about it, you know? And in fact, I would even argue that they'd come a long way overcoming lust because they, they look at these bodies every day. Be beneath the skin, the body is quite frightening. It's a, it's a leering skull. There's like a pitcher of feces. I'm using language from Shankara. I'm using language from the Tripura Rahasya. You know, the body is full of like vile secretions called the Tripura Rahasya. This language is not very popular today 
in a time of radical affirmation of the body, of course, in America, especially, we're recovering from a lot of shaming. That's not the point of this. The point of all of this is to show that the body's not bad. It's not good. It's just five elements. It's just that, nothing buttery. So if you recognize this, if you recognize this pancha bhuta vilasa, then you will go a long way. It will go a long way in diminishing your likes and your aversions, which will give you peace. You can't uh, run away from your aversions. They'll catch up with you. Neither can you really completely satisfy your likes. There is no real spirituality. I dare to say this because I, I will tell you the truth and, and you will come to this. There is no real spirituality where there is still hankering after the things that you like and hankering after escaping the things that you don't like. Yeah, Kobe, we started uh, 52 minutes ago. Exactly. Thank you for the time check. I should move on. <laughs> but I hope that this tool is valuable to you. I hope you can see its application. So Sri Ramakrishna prescribed it to that boy who was looking to get over uh, pleasures. He would say, look, for most things, this will work. Just before you react to the pleasure, before you run out into the world and try to like achieve it, which is you know, a whole other story. You know, uh, and it's the story of humanity. But you can do this. You can pause and say, well, what's in it really? What's in a body? What's in a, a sweet meat? <laughs> Wonderful, Kaz. Me too. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so what's in a sweet meat? What's in a sweet meat? Like, that's the thing. That's what he's saying. And now, okay, that's not always going to work. So Ramakrishna, Paramahansa, he understands that. He understands this is not always going to work. Sometimes, even if you know this, as we said last week, even if you're cognitively aware that there's nothing in the sweet meat that's not here in the potato curry, your effective faculty doesn't care. It will continue to go and be propelled towards the sweet meat. That's okay. Sri Ramakrishna gives you a second technique, and it's this. While you are enjoying the rasagula, while you are eating it, even then you should be applying this kind of panchabhuta vilasa discernment. Okay, mind, you speak to your mind. You say, oh, mind, here is this rasagula. Are you fully satisfied? I mean, it's nice. It's delicious. But was it really everything that you were hoping for? I mean, are you really, truly satisfied? And the mind might say, yeah, bro, this rock. Mm. Okay, good. Let it, let it, really let it enjoy it. And then after it eats it, like a child, sit down with the mind and like break down that experience. Okay, mind, was it worth it though? You know, like the, the time and the money. I mean, are you lastingly fulfilled? Like that, you can do this kind of inquiry with Pancha Bhuta Vilasa even during and after the satiation of an appetite. Now, mind you, I'm not speaking against appetites. Life is beautiful. Go and live it. Okay. I can't tell you how many people come to spiritual life um, and go away feeling moralized or condescended to. You know, that's not the point. Like spirituality is not here to make the world less fun. It's not a wet blanket for you. If you still want to go and enjoy the world, please do it. Please go and enjoy the world. Okay. Eventually, there's no... I think there's no rush. Eventually, you'll end up here anyway. Sooner or later, you'll all be monks, nuns, renunciants. All of you will be Jesus, whether you want to be or not. All of you, not literally Jesus, he's an avatar, but all of you will get to Jesus level spirituality. Like St. Francis, where the flower will delight you and you'll cry in tears and you can just wear a robe and be simple and stop uh, objectifying everyone and everything. Like that will happen anyway. Um, but this language is just for those of you who are sincerely and seriously trying to get that. It's not to dissuade you from enjoying pleasures. But anyway, those of you who do want to overcome these lusts and desires and cravings, sensing that you prefer peace, then, uh, yeah, purity, purity. Those of you who want this purity, not to say immoral or impure, but just those of you who want this kind of simplicity, dare I say it, you can apply this, pancha, bhuta, vilasa. Before, during, and after the satiation of any appetite that you feel is not spiritually nurturing. So that's the first tool to offer today. And so my first task, my first task of three, I'm going to consider it somewhat done. Check. A tool for renunciation. That's the first one. Okay. Now let's go to the third rung of the ladder. Maya Vilasa. Pancha Bhuta Vilasa, the, the, the play of five elements. What is that really? If the Jagat, if this universe is nothing but the play of five elements, then what is the play of the five elements? Let's reduce it some more. Let's inquire further. Don't stop here. If Oh, by the way, if you stop here, you, you'll be very, very happy. Like if you can stop here, then you can just take what comes and you'll be very peaceful. I think this is where stoicism kind of ends. I don't want to say that. It's, it's a very rich philosophy, but I, this is the great gain of stoicism. And like, you know, really go with it. You can stoicism. I mean, Marcus Aurelius and Seneca and all that. Like really, if you take this, you will have a lot of serenity at least in life. And I think it's a very underrated thing, serenity, peacefulness. To be at peace is very, have you noticed, very underrated. Everyone wants to be exuberant and excited. And then tomorrow, hangover, in the bed, excitement gone, depressed, right? Like everyone wants to go between these two extremes. But imagine the peaceful person totally poised between the two. If the 
So I was sniffly today, right? The nose is sniffling and sniffling and sniffling. I imagine maybe there's a world in which I'm like, I resist this. I don't want to be sniffling, you know? Because last night I had stayed up all night doing the puja and you know, it's been a little rough, rough on this body. So maybe we'll put it down and let it sleep later. But it's like reacting. It's sniffling. It's all that stuff. And I'm thinking, okay, well, this body doesn't belong to me. It belongs to Kali. But if I didn't have the, the Panchabhuta Vilasa model, it's easy to be like, oh, I don't want this. You know, I've got a lecture to give tonight. I need it to, no, it's okay. What comes, comes. Health is fine. Bad health is fine. Like both are okay. This is the value of peace. And you get it through Pancha Bhuta Vilasa. If that's not enough, the next blow will it hopefully give you even more peace. And that's Maya Vilasa. Because you know what? Five elements are still something. <laughs> you might come back and say, yeah, okay, Nish. Everything is just the five elements, but I want the elements right you might you might be a smart ass and come back and say no i want the fire the water the earth it's i want the elements okay what if i told you they weren't even there though because the pancha bhuta vilasa ultimately is maya vilasa the play of maya was that alan watts cast the piece is an act of rebellion or something Though I think that takes itself too seriously. The peaceful person won't even consider rebellion or anything. They're like, they can't be bothered. <laughs> They're just like, okay. <laughs> like that story of Shiva who's meditating and Daksha walks in and then Daksha's like, why isn't Shiva standing up to receive me? It's not because Shiva doesn't like Daksha. It's just that he's indifferent. Anyway, for the Shivas in the room. <laughs> okay, so um, let's move on. Maya Vilasa. Now, Maya Vilasa argues that this Panchabhuta Vilasa isn't even there. Mayavada, the doctrine of Maya, which is a tool in Advaita Vedanta, but also appears in Buddhism as Shunyavada, uh, the school of doctrine of emptiness. These are tools to overcome hankering, desire, craving. They are very powerful tools for renunciation. So follow this closely. It's, this is very exciting to me. The Panchabhutas, yes, obviously they're something. But if you really look at what they are, you'll notice that it's completely incoherent. You know, if you study the really study Jagat, you know, and the scientists have, and they've come to strings and atoms, you know, and, and if you really look at it, you'll realize it makes no sense. And it's actually, not only is it a paradox, it's logically incoherent. If you really use reason, here's what you'll come up with. First, Einsteinian relativity. Next, Heisenbergian uncertainty. And perhaps most damning, Gordelian incompleteness. Now, some of you are like, okay, if I thought the Sanskrit words were arcane, now you're just throwing German names at me. This is even worse. <laughs> okay, let's explain a bit. Einstein, right? Einstein, relativity. Now, if you asked a physicist many, many years before Einstein what physics would look like in 10 years' time, they might want to say an absolute theory of time and space. They'd be very frightened with a relative theory because science is looking for certainty. Then a couple of years later, Heisenberg shows up and says, actually, we're uncertainty principle. What is this particle doing? It's both a particle and a wave, and it seems to be only doing things when we look at it and we're like, oh my God, this is not an observatory universe, as Max Planck, Planck would say. This is a participatory universe. Fuck, fuck, fuck. I mean, oh my God, it's responding to me. I'm you, scientists are trying to objectify the universe so that it can be studied. It's almost like the scientist is saying, You please just stay there, stay, stay. I'm stuck, I'm taking notes, stop. And, and the world is just reacting to the scientist, and it's atoms studying atoms, and it's a mess. Heisenbergian uncertainty shows you that quantum mechanics is a mess. The Copenhagen inference, all of that. It's a very confusing time for science. What is dark matter? What is dark energy? More and more lacunas are appearing. I like that word because I recently seen Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind and the company that erases your memory is called Lacuna. I didn't catch that before. It's like my third time seeing the movie. So I caught it. And Lacuna, it's an English word. It means, I don't know what word it is. It's, like, it's used in English, but it means uh, gaps. Right? So in Eternal Transcendent of the Spotless Mind, you'll have lacunas, gaps in your life, right? Because you erase that. So a lacuna is a gap. Science is full of lacunas. Yeah, Justin, I think it's a very deep movie, actually. I, I, I yeah. <laughs> My wife was showing me like what the movie was actually supposed to be, and it's far darker than the one that I saw. <laughs> I'm like, Jim Carrey, take it easy, man. <laughs> Are you a Buddhist or something? No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> okay, so um, here, lacuna. There's so many lacunas in... Uh, physics in our understanding of the natural world that's why we have relativity and uncertainty now i think godel gives this like to me a kind of death blow to our certainty because a lot of our theories of the universe are mathematical models we use a lot of theoretical physics to understand the world around us in fact observation this might surprise you but science is 
like not even really about observation anymore. Observation is like an afterthought in today's science, you know? So it's like you, you, you use math to discover that there must be a black hole at the center of this, this uh, solar system, right? You know that through math. So you don't even care if it's that, you know that. And then when you actually have the tools to see it and you're like, see it, then you're like, aha, duh. That's an afterthought. The actual existence of the black hole there, where your mathematic mathematical models predicted it would be, that is just justifying the mathematic ma ma mathematical models. You know, so a lot of math is used in physics. It's called theoretical physics, not experimental, theoretical physics. So for that to work, we have to really rely on the axioms of mathematics, right? Like the logical systems of mathematics have to work for us to have faith in the models that are uh, arising out of it. Okay, well, tough luck, but Godel in his paper, 1930s, Incompleteness Theorems, show us that uh, the axioms themselves are paradoxical. They can be questioned. And someone, I think Kaz, mentioned Nagarjuna in the chat. I think Nagarjuna does in the second century AD what Godel is sort of doing, not really, but sort of doing in 1930s, which is proving that these abstract models that the mind can invent are riddled with paradoxes, lacunas. So uh, Nagarjuna in his book, Mula Madhyamika Karika, which I've described as like a hand grenade for the mind, um, he empties out all the, he calls it the tetralemma. Yes, both. Yes, no, both, neither. Like the mind is just logically, it, it encounters logical paradoxes. Any one of these four ways it wants to go. Does the Buddha reincarnate? Yes, there's going to be a logical problem. No, there's going to be a logical problem. Neither, logical problem. Both, logical problem. And so what do you do? The mind is like cornered and it just, it can't bear the onslaught of Nagarjuna's logical force, you know? Similarly, that's, I think, the effect of understanding, really understanding um, the incompleteness theorems. Bye, dear Aishwarya. You know, because then you really start to feel like, oh my God, this world is riddled with paradoxes. Now, let's do another thing. So, okay, we've talked a little bit about science, right? Which echoes this idea of Maya. If you had to describe Maya, you would say something... Uh, unreal appearing real or something appearing in the locus of its absence. These are technical definitions of Maya that we get from Vedantic literature. Something appearing in the locus of its absence. That's to be very philosophically precise. Um, but you could also say it's like incoherence. Maya, the definition of Maya, and funnily enough, I'm looking at Mia's screen right now. Different screens pop up, but I'm looking at Mia's screen. So it's funny that I'm looking at almost the word Maya. Maya is the magician. She's so funny. She's so full of beauty um, and paradox. You know, she's, she's a manic pixie dream girl. Dare I say it. <laughs> so very eccentric, but it's hard to understand. I know, I know. Manic pixie dream girls, I guess you can, in the, the archetype can be pigeonholed. But this is the ultimate manic pixie dream girl. You don't know what she's going to do. She's super unpredictable. Uh, and she's incoherent. Yeah, I'm not saying you, Mia, are incoherent. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm just joking. Maya is incoherent. So why? Because it's uncertain, it's relative, and it's incomplete. We can't understand this world. So, you know, if you're really sure that this is Pancha Bhuta Vilasa, don't be so sure. Because Pancha Bhuta Vilasa reduces to incoherence, incompleteness, uh, relativity. Okay, let's go further. Uh, what is this universe? Pancha Bhuta Vilasa. What is it? Ultimately, in physics, you can say it is a time-space matrix. Okay? Time-space matrix. We get that from Einstein. This is the realm of time and space. Exactly. This is exactly the language of the Upanishads, which is, this is Kala, uh, Vastu, Deha. Uh, 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 so Kala, uh, Kala, uh, space, Niyati, time, Kala, Kala. Uh, Kala is uh, time, Kali, right? Kala is space. Niyati is causality. So time, space, causality. Vastu means objects. So there's uh, many ways to describe it. I, I'm mixing up some tantric models with some Vedantic models and I, I got jumbled up. But anyway, uh, Kala, Kala, uh, basically time, space and causality, Niyati. So let's, let's work with time for a moment. Time is super paradoxical. It makes no sense. If you really look at time, you'll realize it's an appearance. It appears to be the case that there is a moving present. No, it feels like the present is the future coming to you and moving away. That's what the present is. It's like a moving. The present is something that comes from the future and goes into the past. I'm not just making this up. This is actually a theory. It's called the A series of Mick Taggart. It's a, he's an actual philosopher in the 60s, I believe, 50s or 60s, Mick Taggart as a philosopher of science, actually. And he's looking at quantum mechanic studies and stuff. And he proposes the A theory or the A series of time. It's called the moving present model. It's not, by the way, the dominant model now. The dominant model, somewhat eerily, is called the B-series. 
uh, in order to explain backward causality, in order to make sense of some of the lacunas, it seems more plausible that the past, present, and future coexist. Right? I don't know about McTaggart Westerfer. I don't know that he was a rock star, but it was the 60s, so maybe. <laughs> I, 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 when I think about the 60s, I think everyone has an acoustic guitar. Everyone. I don't, I, just like, I don't know why that's my image of the 60s. And they're sitting in the grass in San Francisco, upset about something, but I'm not really sure what it is. I know it's kind of like Vietnam, probably a lot more. Um, okay. So anyway, whether McTaggart was a rock star, I don't know. Um, but he suddenly believed in the A series, which was quickly swapped with the B series, which argues that there's no moving present. In order to explain backward causality, time, is static. The past, present, and future all exist at once. I mean, that's kind of, a, it's thrilling, right? The thrilling idea that this is just one block. They're calling it the block theory. And it's, it's, it's again, sorry, it's a mess. Understanding time is a mess. And let's use Zeno's paradox. So let's not even like look at all this stuff that's happening in theoretical and experimental phys physics. Let's forget all these like fancy philosophical names and academic papers. Let's forget about all of that, okay? Let's just look at um, and hold on to that question, Tanmay. Let's just look at it. Kind, it almost is, right? It's basically prakriti. It's kind of eternalism. But let's look at uh, just a basic logical argument about time. So I'm going to attempt now uh, an argument. It's called Zeno's Paradox. And Arindam Chakravarti ji, uh, Professor ji, he kind of he presented it this way. So I'm going to repeat to you what he said in one talk in New York. It was like this. Try to map time spatially. We know we can do that. We can represent time spatially and we can represent space temporally. So try to map time spatially in the case of an apple falling from a tree. Om Triambagam Yajamahe. Okay, like pluck me, Lord, like a cucumber. Okay, so let's say Shiva plucked you and now that tree, the, the fruit is falling from the tree. Okay, now map this spatially. Uh, if you freeze the frame, the distance the fruit traveled is called the past. The distance the fruit will travel is called the future. And where the fruit is now is called the present. Fair? By the way, this is going to be one of the more philosophically nuanced lectures. So I'm really playing tonight. I'm kind of entertaining myself. So I hope you, I hope you don't mind. I hope it's, this is as fun for you as it is for me. So, okay. Now, in order to have a past, in order to have a future, you need to have a present. Without that present there, there's no sense of the past or of the future, right? Okay, good, good. If you have to go, then go, all right? I know we're, we're like at eight. If you have to go, go. So that's a recording. Those of you who want to stay, stay. Um, I'm just going to go for another like maybe 25, 30 minutes. I'm almost there. And I might do this. It might be a two-parter. I don't know. Because if this is time, it's a paradox apparently. Because I was hoping to be much further along in the lecture <laughs> than I am now. But anyway, so let's say the present now is the thing that you need. Without the present, you cannot define the past or the future. The present is the way to get the past. It halves that journey of the fruit from the branch to the floor. Okay. Here's the problem though. If you zoom into that present, it can be divided into two parts, the past and the future. So there's the past of the present. Then there's like a second order past, which is in the present. And then in the present, there's the future, but then there's also the future in the present. So if you map this spatially and you like put two boxes here, like, okay, past, future, this too can be halved. And then that too can be halved. And notice you can halve it again and again and again and again. Whoop. What do we have? An infinite regress. Gone. You've lost your present. No, 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 no. The present is not infinitely small. It doesn't exist. There's no present. The more you look for it, the more it runs away from you. It's like running to the horizon. The horizon keeps vanishing. You're never going to catch the horizon. What's another band? Bring me the horizon. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to like, present, come. No, bro, you can't be here now. You can't. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Eckhart Tolle. I'm sorry. You can't be here now. There is no fucking now, bro. This is Zeno's paradox. It's simple as that. You can never find the now. It's not in time. There's no now. I mean, of course, what they mean, what, what Ram Das is saying in Be Here Now, what Eckhart Tolle is saying in uh, The Power of the Now, they're not talking about the literal now in the scale of past, present, future. Okay, they're talking about the now of being outside of time. To their credit, they're talking about the now of timelessness. That's what they mean by presence. But you can't do it like this. A lot of people misunderstand those guys. And I think they're looking to be here now, not in the past, not in the future. I'm sorry. There is no place to stand called the now. Look, it's Zeno's paradox, isn't it? I mean, yeah, I know. This is a, don't worry. Well, in the Q&A, if any of you are confused here, we'll hash it out. This is, I think, a, a rather intermediate to advanced topic. That's why I'm excited. And, you know, I hope you are too. So, okay. Now, split, 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 split. What you get is Zeno's paradox. This is some 
old philosophical idea. It's Achilles is like racing a turtle or something, you know, and, and what happens is in order for Achilles to beat the turtle or outrace the turtle, he has to travel a distance, A to B. But in order for him to get to B, he must first get to C, which is half the distance of A to B. Now, in order for him to get to C, he must first get to D, which is half the distance of A to C. In order for him to get to D, he must first get to E, which is half the distance of A to D. And in order for him to get to, I'm not just demonstrating my mastery over the English alphabet here. I'm showing you that um, the Achilles cannot move. Movement is a paradox. <laughs> Movement is logically impossible. Now, here's the thing. If you people really care about reason, and there are precious few who do. If you really want to be reasonable, you'll see that there's nothing about this Maya that is. <laughs> Time is unreasonable. It's a paradox. Space is unreasonable. Achilles can't cover space. Um, causality is also unreasonable. I'm very tempted to take 20 minutes to demonstrate the paradoxes of causality. I don't want to because let's just move on. <laughs> um, so done. I think this is enough to prove that if Maya is indeed time, space, and causality, it's incoherent, it's a logical paradox. That's one way to refute arguments, actually, in philosophy, to show a paradox, to show a contradiction. If you can reductio ad absurdum an argument, you, you can dispel it, you can dispense with it. There's no reason why you should continue to operate with the premise that you've reductio ad absurdum. Why should this whole world, bro, reductio ad absurdum it right now and finish with your fascination with it? It's not there. Do not hold on to premises that your logic has emptied out of meaning. That's renunciation. It's an intellectual conviction. You know, I, uh, in philosophy, when I was uh, in, uh, at school, I was philosophy major. So I love logic. I was taking all these classes in Western logic. I love Navya Nyaya, the Indian logic. And I was comparing it to these like Western logic systems. And I was doing this program called Logic Pro 2010 or something like that. It's like a cool internet program. And it's like, it's like old, it's like blue color. The screen is blue and it's a very low budget almost program, but it's amazing. You can generate these logic problems and like type, type, type. I felt like a hacker. I felt like I was in the matrix, like chick, chick, chick. I don't know how to use computers, but I loved that Logic Pro program to death. And it seems like what this is, is typing in the equation. It was all symbolic logic. So it was like A and B and all that. But it's like typing the equation, the world exists. There are things in the world I should be scared of. The world exists. There are things in the world I should hanker after because they're nice. Do the steps of logic and you'll get a reductio ad absurdum. You'll get a contradiction and you'll be like, oh my God, that initial premise, you know, uh, one strategy is to pr disprove its opposite. That's another, if you want to prove that premise, you can disprove its opposite. But here you can actually disprove it directly. And you can prove its opposite, funnily enough. Okay, so um, there are many ways, but ultimately we're ending up with this. If this Pancha Bhuta Vilasa is indeed Maya, then it's Maya Vilasa is nothing also. It's nothing. It's, it's completely empty. Okay. And in order to have a longer q and I'm going to practice some restraint. I'm going to stop here, actually. <laughs> you know, because how what will happen is I'll just take the next hour and do like a second lecture. I'll be a two-parter. Let's just actually do it next week. Let's digest this much first. Let's debate this much. Yeah, thank you, Justin. See, I can learn. I can grow. No, I can't, right? Like the idea is that growth movement. No, no, no. <laughs> but okay, we're going to stop here. Uh, we've gone three rungs up the seven rung ladder. We've gone from Jagat to Panchabhuta. From Panchabhuta, we've gone to Maya Vilasa. Um, and then next week, we're going to do something very interesting. Okay, We're going to go from Maya Vilasa to Chid Vilasa. We're going to say this whole world called Maya, this inscrutable illusion, this play of Maya is really the play of consciousness. So now we introduce this God figure. But don't worry, Buddhists in the room are going to rejoice because we're going to systematically rubbish all the ways in which this God could have created a world. You know, we're going to say it's incoherent to suggest that there is some creator deity that stands apart from this world, creating it like a person creating a clock. We're going to use Mandukya Karika, the lo logic of Gaudapada, to show that all the different Karyavadas, all the different laws of causality are logically incoherent. So God could not have made this world out of nothing. Uh, God could not have been the effect pre-existence in a cause. We'll look at Sankhya. We'll look at Nyaya Vaisheshika. We'll look at um, Karmavada. And Buddhists in the room might not rejoice because we're also going to take up the uh, 
what do you call it? The Artha Kriya ka, uh, Karitvam, you know, the Artha Kriya Karitvam of Buddhism, the functional practical efficiency model. Like the world has cause and effect. We're also going to try to rubbish that using a dream metaphor. But don't worry, Tibetan Buddhists would like it. Just classical Buddhists like Dharma Kirti and stuff might not. <laughs> the Buddhists would like the cause and effect stuff, the more eternalist of the Buddhists. So anyway, um, that's next week. We'll look at, maybe the question next week will be this. How did God create the world? Surprise, surprise, she didn't. She didn't. The world is an appearance. So next week, we'll look at Chid Vilasa, and then crazily, we'll look at Chid Vivarta, the positing that this world is indeed an appearance. Then the week after that, I think this is what's going to happen. The week after that, if I'm going to keep the lecture to one hour, we'll do Chid Chin Mayam and Chin Matram. So the last two, okay? So we did three today. We'll do two next week, and we'll do two more the week after, completing our seven-rung ladder. So let's recap. First, you start with this world, Jagat. If you just take it as it is, you are an unthinking, unfeeling, unexamined life person. You can only play that game so long. Now, when you start to inquire, you realize what is Jagat? Nothing but the play of the five elements. Knowing this, even a scientist, a materialist reductionist, even they can say, I can renounce the world. Meaning, I have no need to privilege this, I don't need to privilege that. Ultimately, it's all just a play of five elements. And then for even more dramatic and lasting renunciation, you can reduct your ad absurdum, even those five elements to Maya, the incoherence and inscrutability of time, space, causality. So we'll stop there. Okay, we'll stop. Um, and let's open for Q&A. Um, and then we'll do the rest of the ladder next week. And maybe in Q&A, we can even do some glimpses of the rest of the ladder. Some of you will probably know it already anyway. Okay, so please, uh, let's use the raise hand function for q and I'm just going to chant. And then we'll open the floor for q &A. So thank you all for coming. All right. Om Purnamada Purnamedam Purnat Purnam Mudachyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyate Om Shanti Shanti, Shanti, Hari Om Tat Sat, Shri Ram Krishna Panamastu. Om, the unseen is whole. The seen is whole. From the unseen whole appears the seen whole. And as an ocean is neither aggrandized nor diminished by the rising and falling of waves, so too am I, wholeness unchanged by the rising and falling of worlds within me. Om, peace, peace, peace be unto us all. Thank you all. I've leveled up, learned some restraint. Now it's going to go to my head and I'm going to lord it over all.